Um, uh, as I said, I'm a, I'm a sort of, I'm a Buddhist Geese listener and fan, as maybe I guess you all are as well. And so I'm very much um, in a peer dynamic with you. Um, I'm not a teacher, I'm just a very average meditator. And um, I thought, rather than sort of tell you a story of my expertise or anything um, like that, I thought I'd share a little about um, what is motivating me right now. What are the questions I'm asking um, in the work that sort of Vince hinted at that we're doing together? So um, this talk is about sort of what gets me out of bed. Um, although I sort of I have a non-lazy mind, so yeah, it's not too hard to get out of bed. And the um, it is a bit of an invitation, this talk, so I hope you feel that um, uh, energy uh, through it. But I'm going to start um, on two, today's what, Friday? I'm going to start on Tuesday night, because I have something very special on Tuesday night. Um, I, this was my view on Tuesday night. I was in the Olympic Stadium in London. Um, this is the, the picture of uh, the medal ceremony for the women's pole vault, which I think American lady won. Um, and, um, like, it's really hard. Um, I, I'm not saying that America, obviously, like, um, here in the States, um, Olympics is really important, and um, the States has a really strong history of the Olympic tradition and the Olympic spirit. Um, but it's really hard to explain to a non-British person the sort of the, the, the experience of London 2012 is having on the UK. It's quite um, amazing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the, the US has this really strong um, patriotism that's, built, that's sort of trained into uh, the, the nation through schooling and through whatever, and sport is part of that. But in the, UA, in the UK, it's slightly different. We have a slightly um, uh, pathological, maybe, relationship to our identity. Um, if you just think of the, the flag, the UK flag, the, the Union flag, as it's now called, um, pretty much prior to um, the last couple of weeks. Um, the relationship or the, the popular narrative around the Union flag is one of rather grotesque nationalism, of um, post-empire, post-colonial, um, this sort of echo of um, we're slightly better than everyone else and we, should, we, we, we sort of really wish we would be ruling everyone still. Um, <laughs> as... Uh, as uh, as the Brits used to do. And, but now, there's a whole new sense of national pride um, in a way that sort of transcended sport. And there are two words that, well, there's one big word um, that is uh, important to the UK right now. It's legacy of the games. Um, the economic, the social um, legacy, how, like, it's a big, it's nine billion uh, pounds, what's that, sort of 15, 16 million US dollar, billion dollars has been spent on London 2012. And um, uh, it was sold. The Olympics were, the, the, the reason uh, London won the bid seven years ago was very much around this idea of legacy, that it would change, regenerate um, parts of East London that were very desolate. And also um, engender, um, uh, connect, uh, the country, and specifically young people in the UK, um, with sport. And the idea that, that uh, having such elite athletes and amazing stories that transcend sport on our doorstep would um, empower and inspire um, all of us. Um, and time will tell whether that would be the case, but uh, the, the, the seeds of that are very much there and um, um, have felt. And a part of that is this idea of play. So um, there's actually very little data. Um, I was listening to a podcast of some economist who studies like these big sporting events. And he was saying there's very little data about having elite sports uh, events in your country or your city and its correlation with um, people getting out of their houses and going and play sport, sort of amateur sport, um, whatever. Um, uh, but this idea of um, play is one I want to sort of, I, um, I uh, sort of jump off my, um, my talk here after it's the sort of the diversion into the Olympic Stadium. And because um, play has been really important to me as a practitioner. 
Um, so I, uh, one of the most sort of um, important teachings I've had is around, was um, a teacher, a Burmese teacher called uh, Utejaniya, who um, really empowered me to approach practices um, with playfulness. Um, and uh, that if you can um, find fun and play in, in, in a practice, then um, the learning and the progress and the insights will come lubricated um, by that attitude. Um, and uh, as, a, uh, as Vince hinted at, I'm of Sri Lankan heritage, which is a Theravada country, and so I grew up with a lot of iconography around me. Um, and I've always seen the, the, the half smile on the Buddha statue as an invitation amongst all the commitment to actually be that little bit playful. Um, and so that has been a real theme um, of, my, uh, of my sort of experience of uh, the Dharma and Buddhism and everything, uh, whatever word you want to use. Um, and every, every player needs a playground, and the playground in my instance is the city. And um, I've tried the forest, I've tried the mountaintop, but the Wi-Fi signal isn't so good. So um, <laughs> I've, uh, I've made a big point of uh, committing myself to to urban practice, um, and despite the sort of the, the sort of modernity of all the, the life that I have, I'm very much inspired by um, uh, the tradition. It's a it's a it's a luxury of having being a um, of uh, Sri Lankan origin that I do have a strong connection with the tradition. There's a sort of semi well known, not that well known, maybe in, um, uh, another Burmese teacher, older. Who's not, I think he died in, in the 30s or 40s, called Webu Saidor. Um, and uh, he was pretty hardcore. Um, and uh, his, uh, I remember, I, I got this, it's a very, um, he was very influential on a teacher called Uba Kin, who was the teacher of Goenka, who um, uh, helped uh, distribute a certain style of practice. And um, the message I got from Webu Saidor's teachers was very much around, you could summarize it, summarize it as all he said was, you're not hardcore enough. To, uh, to, in all his talks, that all he would basically say, because he he would have this, because um, uh, all the all the sort of talks you, they're all just questions and answers. The books you can get on him, or the one or two books, and this thing comes up all again and again. Like even in one thin volume, the same question will be, uh, or the same response will will come up. And he would uh, he would uh, have a go at his students and say, um, so student, um, do you think you're a really hardcore practitioner? And they'd go, yeah, I am. Um, he said, well, have you practiced 24 hours a day? And then the, the student would go, uh, and then, well, you're not hardcore enough. So this idea of like, um, 20, like he, he meant it sort of really like sort of, um, he was like a sort of, uh, a sort of lay his body on the line kind of guy. And like he really meant 24 hour practice. But for reading that from my perspective of a slightly different angle, um, the word that came to me is pervasive practice. So, um, uh, how can I practice in, uh, in this city environment um, in uh, a way that's authentic, um, but is, uh, is 24 hour in the way that sort of maybe we understand it more rather than literally 24 hours. Um, and so I, uh, I brought this sort of playful attitude and this idea of practicing everywhere um, to my, this has been my experience as a practitioner. Um, I've, I've done uh, obviously lots of sort of formal retreat practice, but uh, since 98% of my life so far has been in non-retreat practice, this pervasive idea is really important. Um, and so another word for play in, in the sort of circles that I live and work in is hack. So, um, and we all do it. We, we all, everyone here is a hacker of the Dharma. We take methodology, systems, techniques, teachings, and we make them personal to ourselves. And we sort of we cobble together teachings with bits of string and sellotape, and we sort of make it all work. Um, and we get results and progress and um, what, the, what we're looking for. And that's uh, the experience of hacking. Um, and uh, I, so this is my experience. I was um, uh, living in London in a, at the time. Most, um, uh, most sort of my main, I've only recently moved to Scotland. So um, I work as a, I work as a um, formerly a sort of uh, management consultant, so busy, like busy uh, environments, and I was just hacking my way through and hacking ways of trying to find the spirit of Webu's, uh, Webu Saidor's um, uh, 
invitation for pervasive practice. Um, and I came and sort of, um, I've done all, we've, I came up with various sort of tips or, or just practices of when I'm walking to work, when I'm um, on the subway, when I'm at my desk, um, when I'm at home, all those different things, which helped inspired by but augment the more traditional practice that I was, um, I was practicing. Um, and then I thought, okay, that's very interesting. Um, what happens if you take a hack? Because a hack is quite um, clumsy. It works, um, but it, wasn't, it wouldn't be something that you'd want to um, uh, show off. It's sort of a bit sort of clumsy, clumsy and clunky. So um, I thought, what if, uh, what if I took those, those hacks and added design to them? Um, and this came about from my experience of uh, speaking to people, just people in conversation, and them saying, um, I'm really interested in meditation, but I've never got into it. Um, uh, there's been barriers to that. And I spent time with those people, would investigate what are those barriers, um, and, and uh, started asking questions that designers would ask. Um, and I thought, oh, that's it. this is interesting. Um, maybe some of those hacks, which I have personally benefited from, could have a bit more design quality to them and be turned into a product. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, it was a bit of a, it's a big glorious experiment. And I, um, last, uh, end of last year, I took um, several of the sort of techniques and tools from, uh, that I developed and also all just sort of hacked together and also that I knew that uh, many of you do already. And I um, jammed them into a tiny device like this and made an app called Buddhify, which is all about, it's a mobile meditation app, which is explicitly for people who've never got into meditation but want to, and want um, uh, a much more sort of uh, convenient, in quotation marks, ways of getting into meditation. Um, and uh, it was a big experiment, but then interesting started, things started to happen. I started getting feedback that it was actually working. Um, people who were, would contact me from all around the world, um, just saying like that it was doing what it, it sort of tried to do, which was um, uh, bring, um, bring in just one more new access point um, to the stuff. Um, and when, uh, because, it, because there are many sort of uh, things like uh, Britify out there, um, I was getting a lot of people asking me, okay, so what's next? Um, What's the, what's the next idea? What's the next thing? Um, and uh, I could tell you about all the sort of Buddhify extensions that um, we're planning, but I want to tell you about the big idea, um, which is uh, what I call the layer. Um, and uh, so this is, this, is, um, uh, this is not one thing. So um, that's a picture of a cake. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was just to give a sense of like, so there are lots of layers in, um, I'll explain, give a sense of what I mean by layer. So um, I'll def the, my definition of a layer is, of the layer that I'm talking about specific, specifically is wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and whoever we are, we have access to the tools, support, and community that will help us develop our practice. Um, so whether you're, um, and that uh, can be real time uh, in the way that Lama Suridas was talking yesterday, or it can be sort of non-real time. So um, uh, Buddhify does a very small piece of the layer. It, it finds the person who has, doesn't have that much, uh, who hasn't got into meditation yet, um, and uh, gives them a, a real time way of learning meditation through uh, guided audio. So. Um, but that's a very small part of the layer. There's other parts of the layer which are for um, uh, more advanced practitioners. How do we connect resources um, in better ways uh, and so on. So that's the sort of the introduction of what the layer um, is. And I'll just give sort of some analogies that have already existing and happening. So the big layer um, that has occurred in the last 10 years is the social layer. So this isn't news. Um, so the idea that you're able to connect um, with others, have conversations around topics of shared interest, share parts of your life, um, particularly and uh, have grown into 
um, really grown in the last 10 years, enabled by new technologies that we're all uh, familiar with. Um, but it's not all, uh, the social layer is not all uh, uh, digital. This event, um, this meeting together is in a result of the social layer because it started as a podcast network and has now grown into a face-to-face -face community and meeting. And so um, that's the, the social layer has clearly been a massive impact in the last 10 years. In the last three years, or maybe four years, we've seen this really horrible term um, called gamification, which is, uh, you can think of it as the game layer, where um, uh, entrepreneurs and companies and whatever have using, using what's um, called game mechanics and play to overlay different parts of our life. So from, if you know, like Nike plus Fuel Band is, the, is gamifi gamifying fitness. Um, and uh, you, there's ways of, uh, in the education sector, you're seeing um, what to incentivize people to study, they get certain rewards and incentives, and that's the gamification of education. Um, so that's gamification. Um, the layer that I'm uh, interested in us actually building together, which we're already doing, um, is, this is the most horrible word. <laughs> But I'm going to say it. It's contemplative. Uh, I say contemplationification, and it's such a horrible word um, that uh, that's why I call it just simply the layer, or more accurately, the heart layer. So the heart layer already exists. Everyone here is actively involved in it. Um, if you're a teacher or scholar, or um, you you are already providing um, uh, access to teachings and support and community. Um, but what's different, obviously, in the last um, few years is that the, um, the layer we have right now is not covering um, the, the, uh, the, the full potential of what the heart layer could do. So in, in, many, in many ways, the world has become smaller, and we, we've, all found the bene we've all found the results of that. But the, um, in another way, it's become bigger in the sense that there are new domains, new spaces um, available for practice. Um, uh, what I call um, new touch points is, again, it's, another, it's a design term. And so um, there are new touch points for, uh, and opportunities for people to develop wisdom, compassion, and insight. Um, and uh, going back to Willoughby's talk, um, there's a risk, again, the mindfulness question is important. Because um, you hear about um, the role of technology in bringing new access points um, and uh, to the Dharma, and there's the, there's, there's this um, feeling or uh, thought that this is the end of days, um, uh, and it could be the end of days. And it's a very strong analogy to what Willoughby was talking about of the newer science in that um, the unless uh, people like Willoughby are learning the practices of, of deep contemplative experience as well, and then um, uh, design and do the research um, themselves. In this, exactly the same uh, analogy, um, the entrepreneurs who are making these apps and products and technologies um, uh, have to, to make it really um, powerful, have to have really strong contemplative backgrounds themselves. Um, otherwise, there, there is the risk that um, uh, there will be a sort of proliferation of um, superficial things. Um, and so, uh, um, and many of those are in this room today, and so it's really great that um, the, the conversation around um, technology is quite funny because um, this is the only space in the world that I've experienced where I don't have to explain what I do. Um, um, and so, uh, the, um, I just want to sort of leave with a sort of an invitation in that we're all actively participating in this thing called the heart layer, which I the heart layer, um, and uh, it's an invitation to help us build it out, and build it out and build it brilliantly. And there's three ways, to, there's sort of three steps. The first one is to smile, um, uh, and to at, approach um, this uh, big adventure with a spirit of playfulness, alongside with the spirit of dedication. The next step is to hack, which is to try stuff, um, what works, what is working, what are the, what are the new ways of um, Lama Surya has talked about what are these new um, uh, pathways for connections. Let's just try them out. 
Um, let's, if, even if they look rubbish and are held together by string and bits of tape, let's try them out. And if they work, um, let's uh, then add some design onto them. And then maybe we can do what the London 2012 is trying to do. This is the strap line of the Olympics. Um, and um, I think we have the potential to inspire a generation uh, right here um, with our collective wisdom and with the collective wisdom informing the new technology because technology like we've heard before today and yesterday is only a tool in service of, um, of practice rather than being the leader of it. And so um, uh, here's another picture of cake. Another picture of cake. Thank you very much um, for your time. <laughs>